The evidence just keeps piling up. For the Roman Catholic Church, the doctrine of the Trinity is the central doctrine of the Catholic faith. And according to the Pope, Rome's ecumenical effort is a spiritual process that is rooted in the Trinity. To accomplish this ecumenical process, the Catholic Church established the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. Their purpose is Christian unity through the ecumenical spirit. That's exactly what the book Revelation warns will happen in the last days, a global union of false worship. The question is, why is the Seventh-day Adventist Church so deeply involved with this Catholic ecumenical council? We'll find out today on Prove All Things. Hello and welcome. I'm Nader Mansour, and today we're looking at the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. This is the Roman Catholic arm sent out to gather all the churches together in an ecumenical union. Naturally, such a union is going to be based on the God that is worshipped, namely the Trinity. The president of this council is Cardinal Kurt. Now listen to him as he describes how the ecumenical movement is the irreversible path of the Catholic Church. In the Pope's name and acting on his behalf, the Pontifical Council for Promotion Christian Unity undertakes ecumenical dialogues with the other Christian churches and ecclesial communities with the aim of restoring once again the unity of the one body of Christ wounded over the course of history by many divisions. These two commemorative events demonstrate how the ecumenical task remains at the heart of the Catholic Church. So this council operates in the Pope's name and on his behalf and is fully committed to the ecumenical task. This commitment is repeated time and again. Here it is from John Pope II's encyclical of 1995. This is his uh, Ut Unum Sint encyclical on commitment to ecumenism. Notice what he says in it. If we just go down a little bit. The way of ecumenism, the way of the church. Taking part in this movement, which is called ecumenical, are those who invoke the triune God and confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. So those who take part in this ecumenical process, in this ecumenical movement, are those who invoke the triune God. This is according to a previous pope who is now considered a saint, Pope John Paul II. So when Pope Francis said that the ecumenical process is rooted in the Trinity, he was simply echoing the words of John Paul II. Invoking the triune God is an integral component of taking part in this ecumenical movement. And they are both just repeating what was established all the way back in the 1960s in the Second Vatican Council, commonly known as Vatican II. Of course, this is manifested in, uh, in action, in behavior. Here is another page from the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. This is a reporting on the first international meeting of the Global Christian Forum, which happened in 2007 and actually included a number of churches. Uh, here's what it says. We give praise to the Father, our Creator, to Christ, our Reconciler, and to the Holy Spirit, our Comforter. This is the God that is worshipped. This is the Trinity. And then we are told that this is a gathering of Christian communities and inter-church organizations who confess the triune God. So invoking the triune God, confessing the triune God. This is the God that is worshipped. This is the basis for this meeting, for this gathering, and for this union between all these churches in that they all worship the same God, the Trinity. They confess the triune God. And then it gives us a list of the participating churches and organizations in this particular meeting. And lo and behold, among the list is the Seventh-day Adventist Church is one of the participating churches and organizations present in this gathering, and therefore among those who confess the triune God. Now, this of course should not surprise us at all, because in a previous episode, we saw how Dr. Ganon Diop, the General Conference Director for the Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Department, uh, actually in an interview with the Georgetown University, made this very alarming confession. He said, we belong to the family of Christians who confess the Trinitarian God. So you're seeing something here harmonize and match up between what the Pope says, 
between the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, between how their meetings are based on invoking the Trinity and those who actually confess the triune God. And now you hear from the representative of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which was present at that meeting by name, he actually told us in his own words that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is actually part of the Christian family that confesses the Trinitarian God. And it's on the basis of this belief and this confession in the same Trinitarian God that the Seventh-day Adventist Church can actually take part and participate in such gatherings and such events. Actually, that's what we were told. Here it is in the Adventist Review of 2015, an article by Dr. Gannon Dio. Why Adventists participate in UN and ecumenical meetings? Why do they participate? We saw what, it, we saw what Rome says and the conditions from Rome. Here are the reasons given by Dr. Yanun Dio. If you just scroll down a little bit towards the end of this article, here's what it says. Seventh-day Adventists support Christian unity as they join the triune God who is determined to gather people he created in his image. The foundation is the triune God. Now, I want you to keep this point in mind because it's going to come up just a little later. Then he goes on. He says, here are 27 aspects of Christian unity in which Adventists may legitimately participate. Number three, theological unity about fully embracing God's identity revealed in scripture as Trinity. So this is the reason why the Seventh-day Adventist Church can participate in these ecumenical gatherings, which are uh, carried out by the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, which is acting on the Pope's behalf and in the Pope's name. The Pope who said that the ecumenical uh, process is rooted in the Trinity, echoing and repeating the words of John Paul II, who said, to be part of this ecumenical movement, you have to invoke the Trinity. Those who confess the Trinity, and lo and behold, the Seventh-day Adventist Church says, we belong to this family of Christians who confess the Trinitarian God. Here it is right there, recorded in the Seventh-day Adventist Review. Now, it doesn't stop there, because we see that uh, this was not a one-time event. This was not a one-off gathering. In uh, 2018, back to the Pontifical Council uh, website here. In 2018, the Secretaries of Christian World Communion met in Switzerland. And uh, among them, of course, uh, if you can see in the picture right there, is Dr. Gannon Diop, representing the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Why? Because they all belong to the same family that confesses the Trinitarian God. There it is. The meeting was actually seconded by the secretary, who is none other than Dr. Gannon Diop, the director of public affairs and religious liberty for the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church. So he's not there just uh, on his own account, on his own behalf. No, he's there representing the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church in this particular gathering. This happened in 2018. And again, in 2019, the same thing. The annual conference of, uh, of the Christian World Communions 2019, here is the picture. Here is one happy family who all worship the same God. They all confess the Trinitarian God. Among them right there is the Seventh-day Adventist representative, Dr. Gannon Diop, representing none other than the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church. So we see that time and again. And <clears throat> even up to very recently, as recent as last month, 23rd of October, 2020, was the annual conference again for this year. And of course, because of the situation with COVID, the meeting happened online over Zoom. And uh, here are the participants. Again, Dr. Ganon Dio, General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And here are the representatives of the Pontifical Council of the Roman Catholic Church, acting in the Pope's name and on his behalf, here and here. It's interesting that he is listed here this time as Reverend Dr. Ganon Dio of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists acting as secretary. So this involvement of the Seventh-day Adventist Church with this Pontifical Council of, uh, of Rome for promoting Christian unity, this ecumenical council, it's all because they all agree on the God that is worshipped. Now, for evidence of this, we've already seen plenty in previous uh, episodes, but here it is. If you drop down just a little bit, you find this interesting acknowledgement. The recent encyclical of Pope Francis for Tutti was acknowledged as an important encouragement to all Christian communions to unite efforts in building a culture of encounter, solidarity, and universal fraternity across political, social, and religious borders. So, in short, this gathering of all these religious leaders, including the Seventh-day Adventist Church, they all acknowledged 
that the Pope's recent encyclical is of great importance. They endorsed it. They acknowledged it. They said, they basically said, amen to what the Pope said. Well, all we have to do is look at what the Pope said. Because remember, this is one big happy family who are uniting together on the foundation of the God that they worship. They all confess the Trinitarian God. They invoke the triune God. We see him in the gatherings. He is worshipped. He is praised. He is invoked. What is it about the Pope's encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, and what does it have to do with the ecumenical movement and particularly the Trinity? All we have to do is look at it. Here it is, the encyclical letter, Fratelli Tutti of the Holy Father Francis on fraternity and social friendship. It's quite long, but something is mentioned in it that deals with the foundation of it all. Here it is in article number 85, which is the here we are. Here's what the Pope says in his encyclical. This is only last month in October. So this is fresh. This is while everything is happening all around the world, busy with this and that and the other. This is what's happening in the spiritual and religious realm. Notice, here's what he says. If we go to the ultimate source of that love, which is the very life of the triune God, we encounter in the community of the three divine persons, the origin and perfect model of all life in society. Theology continues to be enriched by its reflection on this great truth. Now in this long encyclical, he is basically saying that everything we're talking about as far as brotherly love, fraternity, social justice, all these issues that we have to deal with, they all actually stem from this perfect model. This perfect model is none other than the triune God the three divine persons. It's the model for all life in society. That's the foundation. That's the basis. It's the basis, not just for the ecumenical process and the ecumenical movement and uniting. No, it is the model for all life in society. And theology, teaching, continues to be enriched by its reflection in, on this great truth. In other words, the other teaching are based on this great truth that serves as the foundation that serves as the principle so this issue about the trinity being the central doctrine of catholicism and most important foundational teaching is not some dated idea this is current this is now this is what's happening this is actually what the book of revelation warned us would occur a union in the last days of false worship now we are told what this is based on and lo and behold the seventh day adventist church is part of this process, confessing that they worship the same Trinitarian God and belonging to the same family. Let's look at how this theology influences the practice. Plus, says here, the teaching, <clears throat> the theology is enriched by this great truth of the Trinity, of the Triune God. In other words, the teaching influences the behavior and the practice. Let's look at just, let's just look at one example of that to show how close to home this really is. This is from the Catholic company, who are uh, selling this book, the Blessed Trinity Book of Catholic Prayers. Now, there's an interesting cover. I want to show you the front cover. I want to show you the back cover. Here's the front cover in detail. Three interlocking circles with a triangle. And this is the Trinity Catholic Book of Prayers. Here is the back cover, a very clear uh, image as well of this symbol, which is known as the Triketra. This symbol uh, we dealt with in other presentations. I'm not going to go into the details of it. But if you turn over to the Adventist Book Center, you will find this very interesting book that is also for sale called The Trinity. And on the cover of this book, lo and behold, you actually find the exact same symbol that was found on the cover of the Blessed Trinity Catholic Prayer Book. The symbol is the Triketra. That's the symbol of the Trinity. It's the exact same thing. If you put them side by side, you find it's the exactly, exact same thing. It's not different. It's the exact same God. And just like we saw when the gathering of, uh, in, in that gathering in 2007, that they worshiped and praised the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, invoking the Trinity, praying to this triune God, three persons in one, the same thing actually happens. According to this book, The Trinity, which is published by the Review and Herald. This is a Seventh-day Adventist book written by three Seventh-day Adventist theologians. In this book, this is actually 
what we are told. The oneness in nature and character of the three persons of the Godhead raises the very useful question of prayer, praise, and worship. But what about direct prayer to the Holy Spirit? While we have no clear example of or direct command to pray to the Spirit in Scripture, doing so does have, in principle, some implicit biblical support. It only seems logical that God's people can pray directly to and worship the Holy Spirit. So the reason to worship God the Holy Spirit is because it is logical. It's not because it's biblical. We don't have an example in the Bible. We don't have an instruction in the Bible. But logic leads us to conclude that we are to worship God the Holy Spirit. Now in this segment, they actually say we, we can worship God the Father. You know, we worship God the Son. And also we worship God the Holy Spirit, even though we acknowledge that there is no Bible support. This is confessing the Trinitarian God. This is invoking the triune God, regardless of what the Bible says. And this worship of God the Holy Spirit matches up with exactly what happens in these ecumenical councils and gatherings when they invoke the triune God. Now let's go back to the encyclical letter Fratelli Tutti by Pope Francis, which was issued just last month in October. We already read uh, a section of it dealing with how the doctrine of the Trinity is really the model for all life. Theology is enriched by its reflection on this great truth on the triune God. But I want to drop down to the conclusion of the encyclical where the Pope actually offers up a prayer. And this prayer is recorded just here, a prayer to the creator. And notice what it says specifically at the very conclusion, an ecumenical Christian prayer. O oh God, Trinity of love, from the profound communion of your divine life, pour out upon us a torrent of fraternal love. This is who he's praying to. He's praying to this triune God. He invokes the triune God because he is also part of the family that confesses the Trinitarian God. He prays to this God. And specifically, as it says right here, is praying to the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, show us your beauty reflected in all the peoples of the earth and so on and so forth. This is why they're saying this is the model for all life in the world. Now he's praying here to the Holy Spirit in the Trinitarian understanding. So this is God, the Holy Spirit. He's not praying to the Father. He's not praying to the Son. He's praying to God, the Holy Spirit, a different individual, a different person to the Father and the Son. Now, earlier in the prayer, of course, he prays to the Father, uh, prayer to the Creator. Of course, uh, they also pray to Jesus. They pray to all three. That's what invoking the Trinity is. No wonder then the Seventh-day Adventist Church has no hesitation in confessing that they belong to the family of the same faith. That is the one that confesses the Trinitarian God. And even in practice, in behavior, that affects the prayer life as we just saw. Because they see no qualms, they see no issue in praying to God the Holy Spirit, even though there is an admission that there is no biblical support for it, because it seems logical. So as we saw earlier, the Catholic book, Blessed Trinity, book of Catholic prayers, is all about all kinds of different prayers that are prayed, and it's dedicated to the triune God, in like manner, the Seventh-day Adventist book, entitled The Trinity, bearing the exact same symbol, instructs its readers and comes to the same conclusion of we can worship God the Holy Spirit, invoke the Trinity without any biblical support. I hope you now understand why the Seventh-day Adventist Church is so deeply involved with this Roman Catholic Pontifical Council. It's because they have the same God, they worship the same God, they pray to that God in the same way, in the same words, the same phraseology. Even the books have the same symbols on them with the same contents when it comes to the practice and how the theology uh, is influenced by reflection on this Trinity, on this God that is worshiped. It is tragic that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is actually part of such a movement. You know, there are a number of people and even ministries have reported on Dr. Ganon Diop's involvement with this ecumenical process, you know, things like uh, pictures of when Dr. Ganon Diop met with the Pope and shook hands with him. And yet nobody really identified the underlying reason and foundation for why such a thing is, pos uh, is possible. Yes, it is bad, but why is it actually happening to begin with? It is because the same God is worshipped. It's interesting that picture you actually see that right there is the president of the Pontifical Council, Cardinal Kurt, happy, smiling, because the Pope and uh, Dr. Diop are shaking hands. This is the family of Christians who confess the Trinitarian God. This is why they can all stand together as part of, me as members of this one big family, all worshiping the same God. It is for this reason 
that God sends a message in the last days recorded in the book of Revelation, known as the three angels' messages, to restore worship back to him, the true God, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. The first angel's message is about worship to the true God, that's God the Father, not to a trinity. This is the basis for true biblical unity. It's not possible to preach the first angel's message, which is about the true God, while worshiping and promoting and defending the God of Rome. This information is shared as a warning, not as a condemnation. It's a call to wake up to what's really going on and an invitation to prove all things and hold fast that which is good.